So, Father, we thank you for this day and this time and this hour we have to gather together with you. We thank you for being our Father, our Master, as we come to you as your children, as your servants. We ask you to continue to guide and direct us in understanding your word and your truth to have us to be changed and convicted and edified and restored and uh, changed from the inside out, from our spirit and soul, and how we and how we have our eyes and ears and mouths and our hands and feet and speak in our bodies that testify and honor you. So we ask you to help us to be more as the people in Antioch Christian, those that are styled, that are, that are doing and occupying business as ambassadors and as ongoing representations of you, that we are the only Bible some people read and knowing that these are informations that we learn from in the scripture, that the depth of your truth is awesome to know, but it's just the beginning of the building a foundation from which to men love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. So we turn now continually looking at your theophanies and your Christophanies and later to your your last supper and your remembrance of these things that we take honor to, to look back and, and look present and look forward to what they all mean. So we thank you for being our pastor, our shepherd, our guide, our teacher in this time. Be with alongside of us. Come with us now and teach and guide and direct and open our hearts, minds, and spirits to hear what you want us to hear, to learn what you want us to learn, to be bettered and strengthened and to be encouraged by you. And thank you when we ask all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And so to clarify, I have to do this on record because it was already on record of my um, uh, behavior, if you will, from Friday, or my tone in my comments. Um, I wasn't attacking anybody. Uh, I think that was clear uh, on the whole issue when I mentioned uh, people by name. But I was a little disappointed in myself and the tone aspect and mixing in different things with the tone. I want to make sure I, I, I mix this clear. I don't regret because everything that is ordained by God is ordained by God that includes my sin, as I mentioned earlier to Sister Lane. So that includes what I said and how I said it. So I don't have anything in my heart that was in hatred or disdain for anybody by no means. Um, but I want to clarify just one thing. I don't want to belabor the point, but I want to make sure it's on air so those who watch the other one go, hey, is that an, off is that an often occurrence with this guy? Not really. I wouldn't say so. Uh, but, but I do want to say that I, did, I don't feel like I attacked anybody. If I did in somebody's mind, then for that I apologize. But I don't think that I did. That wasn't my heart intent. Um, what I did do, though, was get an incensed emotional rising of my level of of defending the honor of God and his character. And that, that's what came out, and because people constantly uh, bastardize him, uh, condescend him, uh, paint him in a picture that's even uh, light and fluffy, and then they put down and insult his sovereignty, and they poo-poo it, and they talk in sneering ways of mockery about how can a guy who's sovereign and in control care about us as we have, if we have no free will. And so that kind of just wear on my, on my conscience a little bit, and I just was defending the honor of God, but over the top, albeit, I was. But that's where that came from, just so you know. Um, and it's an issue for me on the free will thing. It's a big thing with me because, I don't know, it's always been a thing for me. It's just, and babes, and it's been on the way home. She goes, boy, when you talk about the free will thing, you got to really kind of take check yourself, take a deep breath, <laughs> and just kind of, before I start engaging, because it, it just riles up in me that, that core issue of the arrogance of man, as far as I'm concerned. And so anyway, um, and I just don't want to have any part of that. Um, so in anyway, so because of that fact, again, I don't regret what I said and how I said it. I do have remorse over looking back and disappointment over how God ordained that sin in my life and how I, I, I need to learn from that and be better from it. Uh, even though it was ordained, I'm still accountable and responsible, so that's why I don't regret because it's ordained, but I do have remorse in the sense that I want to learn from it and be better. So I hope that makes sense, what I'm saying, because in time and in, in emotions, uh, with, and the best way I can say this to sum this up, as I was mentioning earlier uh, today and, and with Laney and with Babes, so if, 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 since God sees things in, a, in an absolute sense from the hierarchy of heaven, it's, heaven itself from creator viewpoint, he sees past, present, present, and future from his viewpoint is happening all right now. It's all right now. It's all right now. He already sees the world being created. He already sees himself crucified, himself coming again. He already sees Armageddon, the whole thing. It's right now. There's no timeline in God's eyes outside of time. There is no time because that's the whole point of outside of time. Hello. So he sees it all right now. He holds it in his hand. He's like, okay, I got that. I mean, he's, I mean, he's literally saying, he's literally, we're living inside this thing. And he goes, yeah, I, I see all that. And your point is, so, duh. But he chooses to be inside time too, which is, which is like, blah, blah, blah. that blows my mind. So he's out, he's in both. So I don't get how that works, but that's why he's awesome. And I'm not. So, so then you go, okay, so with that in mind, in time though, as I progress, even though he's ordained me to walk the way I walk and, and how I walk and why I walk, blah, 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 blah. but if I'm walking by the board, I'm going to see this part of the board, what I wrote, but as I walk past it, now it's out of my line of sight, but I'm going to see this side of the board. So just as it is in life, my vantage point changes. What's on the board didn't change. Not one iota. Me walking past this part didn't change those words. Really? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So it's how I experienced it, because my vantage point is now focused on this part that's written, and so on, as it is in life. So you, you, your perception changes when you pray, when you focus on what is right. Your perception changes because you experienced it differently. You see the same event, the same thing, the same whatever it is, differently. And so your perception begins to lie to your, your sense of will and conscience and accountability and responsibility and your arrogant sin nature to go, ooh, I changed that. No, God just has already ordained that with time and emotions. It made you believe you changed it when you didn't. You're just experiencing it differently now because now you're aware of something differently because of one, just the physical nature of your perception is different. And two, if your mindset's changed because of how God's changed your heart and mind and spirit. Both of those things play in what I call time and emotions. Both of those things play into how you experience the same event, the same thing that's unmovable, that's before time been ordained. You see it differently because of time and emotions. So I hope that makes sense. So I want to make sure I, I clarify that because I don't want anybody to feel like, how can this guy regret when he says everything's ordained? I don't regret, and neither should you. But I should have remorse over my accountability and responsibility that's been ordained in time uh, that, gosh, I was used to exhibit a sin that I need to learn from. It's just God's way of ordaining to remind me of that where I got my goat tied, if you will. Someone always once said, uh, someone always said once ago, uh, I remember like 17 years ago or so, I heard somebody go, uh, it's okay. Um, to let someone get your goat from time to time that means you're human. What you don't want to do is let them know where you got it tied. <laughs> I'm like, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> and somebody used to say, well, that guy's like a spur in my saddle. I got to get him off. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just a, so certain things are spurs in your saddle and this life, that, that's mine. Certain things are uh, things that get you a little off uh, on topic of emotion and more than usual. And, and that's just me holding it out there. By the way, not to defend myself, but let's just say you or me um, was in the same similitude. If you go for an hour and a half on a Friday, or this time, it was last time it was two hours, and two hours on a Sunday, you do that every week. It's a matter of time before I get your sin on record, too. I'm just saying. So you're going to get me. Don't get me wrong. You're going you're to, ah, gotcha. Yeah, so what else is new? I mean, you're going to find more things about me. I'm not saying that flippantly, though, because it's still wrong, and I'm still remorsed in that habit. I'm just saying from a high level of, of, of jest with you, Please understand, and thank you so much for your patience and forgiveness of me and, and understanding of that situation. I appreciate that very much. Um, all right, so with that being said, I had to get that out there. Um, it's kind of like the retraction the next day in the newspaper, you know. What happened yesterday was need to be restated. <laughs> it's kind of like, <laughs> so anyway, so with, with, with that in mind, now let's go to our study at hand, which is the ongoing and conclusion, potentially, of Theophanies and Christophanies. And I also want to remind you again, if you don't have your elements ready today, today is Communion Sunday, so please have your elements ready to have that uh, reverence that we have for observation of that uh, later on today. Uh, also to remind you uh, that, again, if we don't finish today, Theophanies and Christophanies will begin, we'll, be, we'll continue on next Sunday, because our Fridays will now stop for the summertime, except, except for the one Friday a month that we do for Q&A in July and August, and then the next time uh, that will uh, have Fridays will be just those first uh, two July and August. So off uh, the rest of June on Fridays. All right, so Theophanies and Christophanies. Um, as we looked on the board before, uh, we saw God to review what we've been through and uh, learning and studying as we looked at God and we're trying to see about what's these differences between a Theophany and a Christophany. If you look at the glossary of terms in your, in your, in your book, in the back of the book, I have to update that because I have them both on one line and a general sense of an appearance of God uh, and spiritual form. That's in the back of your book in terms of glossary of terms in the back of your, your book I gave you. In the very last page, you'll see it. Uh, you'll see it right in the back page. It's right right there. See, an appearance of God veiled in another form. I just have a, I have, I have a few scriptures. Well, now in lieu of what we just said, I got some explaining to do. I got to get more detailed about that because that was not wrong. It's just general. And as we go on in life, as we know about as a human, human, as a human person who thinks and sees and experiences things, we get more detailed and understanding, you know, about things in life. We learn that things are, are added unto uh, earlier knowledge and stacked upon that to give more light, more understanding, more meat on the bones, if you will. So in that same vein, I, I learned that Christophanies, Theophanies are a little different. That Theophany is more of a God the Father spiritual manifestation, and a Christophany is more of a physical manifestation of God the Son. So I need to specify that, and I'll do that change for you uh, in the book. But I want to make sure you knew that I am aware of the glossary of terms has to be uh, updated. So as we look back also, we have to look at the fact that 
in relevance to what we've seen so far. We saw that, uh, yes, angels can appear as men. We saw that as a, as a, as a side note. We saw as a side note that, that Ezekiel uh, and that John specifically were taken in the spirit, he says, which means actually literally time travel. Uh, with Jeremiah, he went back in time. With Jer Ezekiel and John, he went forward in time. And it says it specifically in the spirit. So in the spirit does not mean uh, anything else but a literal uh, transporting of a human being in time, which is crazy insane. So anybody who thinks that time travel is possible, I would say yes, as long as God's involved, not when man makes science fiction movies, no. But when God's involved, yes. So of course he can time travel because he already did it when he came in as God the Son. He did time travel. Hello. <laughs> he goes so he went in outside of time. So he's already, the, he is the time traveler of all time. So uh, he created it and lived inside of it and went outside of it and so forth and so on. So with, with that uh, being said, we saw the Lord as appearing in different fashions, and we saw he can appear, he can appear in a dream. He can appear in a vision in a dream. Uh, he can appear a, as, a, as a man, and he can appear in different natural, na natural events. Uh, we saw the difference of why he would appear in, in a vision in a dream. He did that with, with Jacob and with Samuel, which is the only two that were unique, if you remember. Only Jacob and Samuel did he appear in a vision within a dream. And then only with Abram did he appear in a dream in a vision and as a man. So these are uniquenesses we found by studying the details of that. And some may say again, as a preface, why are you studying all this? All this, you're getting too into the weeds, man. Well, and again, I think it's interesting to preface. And if you're hearing me for the first time, please go to www.pfbcstudies.com. P as in precious, F as in faith, B as in Bible, C as in church, studies.com. And you'll see PDFs and other charts and graphs and other sermons you can listen to and catch up with anything you, I'm saying. You go, what is that? So why we do this? Why is because... It's a foundation. It's almost as if someone's saying, I go to Lainey, who's a nurse, or Vicki, who's a nurse in their background, right? And I say, I'm bleeding. Would you just stop bleeding? Stop bleeding. They'd say, first, relax. <laughs> Secondly, let's find out where the blood's coming from. And then before they start transfusing blood into me, um, they just can't do that, can you? Because you got to find out what kind of blood type I am. Then you got to find out what kind of history that I have as well. Do I have, you know, whatever? I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think you'd have to know some history about my blood type and what kind of diseases or other uh, uh, immunities or allergies I have, things like that. Because if you put the person's wrong kind of blood in me, it could make me even be worse and kill me, right? So there's, there's not, you just can't <laughs> react and treat. The, the, I gotta, in order to know all that, wait a minute, in order to know my blood type and to know all the other stuff, it means you have to have gone to some kind of education to know what to reference to know that. Just like Sister Nancy here who teaches as a retired teacher in math, you just can't, you have to know where someone's at before you start asking them a question, right? You just can't, you have to know their aptitude, right, where they're at. If they're, if they're in a, a free enrolled class, I would imagine that you have some people that are advanced more than others, and you may be picking on maybe Sally or Johnny in one case because they can answer the question for you, but maybe, you know, Harry and Susie aren't as up to speed. So you got to, you, and you know that before time because you know they came from an AP class and they're in here, and they came through the other class with a C average. They might need some help along the way. <laughs> so let's not call on them in class and embarrass them. So knowing your subject matter, it helps you to know also who knows their subject matter, who doesn't, and therefore to treat them differently. So the point is education helps you to know how to engage and how to treat people, how to engage them and how to help them, right? So therefore, the same is what it's true with spiritual truth. The more you know educates you in helping you how to engage the Lord himself and then also how you treat other people. That's why Micah 6.8 says, What does God require of you, O man, but to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Now, I always ask people this, and they think sometimes, like, most people get what I'm about to say, but some have told me, oh, you're reading into that. And I say, no. If you think about it and study it yourself, you'll know that I'm telling you the truth. And that is this. How can you act justly unless you know he who is just? How are you going to do that? How can you, because justice means righteousness in the Hebrew or the Greek. And since you're not righteous, no, not one, neither am I. How can we know who is just unless we get to know him through the book? Right? So how can you love mercy unless you know the depravity of a sinner that you are? How, how can you know that? That's why some people say to me, they say, oh my gosh, you grew like a weed when you came to know the Lord when, you were, when I was 20 years old. Because I came from an abusive home life and a, and a degradation of ignorant uh, spiritual life. Where some folks who were taught that all their lives and raised in a spiritual Christian home, in a loving home, they tend to take it for granted. Not that all of them do, but some do. And they tend to say that to me because like, they, they're, they're saying in a truthfulness, a contrast. Well, because I appreciate mercy more than they do. Because I've come from a different depth of despair. So that's just a glimpse of what it really means, which is the depth of all of our sin being darkened and separated from God, all of us being deserving of death. And when you realize God gave you an opportunity 
to not just have life now, but have a greater life later on and a reward and inheritance? Well, no wonder you're going to love mercy. No kidding, right? <laughs> you don't deserve any of that. And then, actually, and then all that, so knowing who God is and knowing who you are, leads you to do the third thing, walk humbly with your God. So the, the Micah 6, 8 is the reason why we do what we do. Because in order to know the God who is just, then it's going to lead you to knowing who, why you should love mercy or the darkness that you are, which leads you to live more humbly and, and understanding that, whoa, who am I? Let me love on you where you are. I don't care if you're gay, straight, black, brown, short, fat, male, female. I don't care what you are. If you're a human and you breathe, I'm called upon to share love to you and courteousness to you. That's what the Good Samaritan story was about. He never said to that guy, hey, are you a Jew or are you a Samaritan? What synagogue you go to? He didn't say any of that stuff. He just said, I saw you bust that up. You have some help. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to give a little extra measure to the innkeeper to make sure you're taken care of. But there was no recollection later on. There was a relationship with these guys, and they became brothers forevermore. That's not what happened. But he did give them an extension of love because everybody in this planet, I don't care if you're completely evil or not, you deserve an extension of courtesy, of decency, because God made you. Because God made you, period. That deserves courtesy and respect to the Creator. Regardless of the creation looks like a dillweed or not, it does not make you have the right to disdain them. That doesn't give you that right to do that. That's the hardest thing to do is to treat everybody the same in a general sense that they are valued as a creation of God, the creator, because you're valuing him when you do that. Hence the reason we, we in Christ believe in pro-life because a life in the womb in conception needs to be valued as well. Okay. Now, with that being said, people say, well, why do we study this? Again, because we have to have the knowledge from which a, a basis is forged. On a, the more depth you have of that knowledge, the better I'm able to engage God, and therefore the better I am able to treat people with the loving compassion I need to, because now I'm changing myself. Well, you know, like Jesus said, ironically, what is the best two commandments? He said, to love the Lord thy God by the heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And all these, he said, these two, the whole law and this prophets and, and exist. So he tells you the very thing I just said. The very thing I just said. You have to be able to engage him and treat people better. And because if you don't do that, then the whole thing, the whole, whole thing hinges on. So those who say, I don't even know all that. You're in the weeds too much. Then how can you love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength? How? How can you if you don't want to get to know him? In our doctrinal statement, I'm going to give you ahead of time a little, little snippet. I wrote out a, a, a thing I've said before to you that if you were to have had a, had a, a phone call one day, it says, hey, come to the courthouse. Um, Eugene Sassafras, you don't even know. You're like, who's that? I, he knows you. So it says here that he gives uh, you uh, $100 billion. What? Who's that? Look, man, he said he knows you, loves and cares about you, gave $100 billion, and he says um, that, you, that you have to you know, do certain things in order to experience the fullness of that benefit, uh, but it's intended for you. And here's the thing. Um, he left this journal about um, his thoughts and feelings about himself and about you and so if you want to read it, you can. You don't, you don't have to. But he says that if you want to learn more about how to utilize $100 billion, and then you do have to, how much time would you spend reading that journal? Probably a lot. So that's interesting how monetarily we're driven to a need to see that. But yet spiritually, that's what we are. We're filthy rich spiritually. And yet you don't see that because you don't see it right now. I can't touch it and feel it. When around us, our angels right now probably laughing, going, if they only knew, <laughs> if they only knew what we see, what we know, if we only knew. Angels right now are probably right now, how you doing, high five. But they're right now probably going, <laughs> that guy is so right, he has no clue what he's even saying. Because they know, you know, and, and then we act like, until we see it, okay, then it will matter to us. Well, then it's too late. That's the, that's the reason why it's called faith. Believing God of what he says. Remember the centurion, Jesus said in Matthew 8, I've seen no greater faith in all of Israel. So why do we study more among the weeks? To engage God, to treat other people. And because it shows a value of respect and love to a God who gave us so much in spiritual wealth, why wouldn't we want to get to know him just as a way of saying thanks? If, none, if nothing else, showing gratitude. Are you, so are you an ingrate? So that's the biggest number one answer I give somebody. They say, you're in the weeds, why would you do that? To show gratitude. If you didn't want to do that, then I would say you're ungrateful. You're say, you're say I am weirdo and I'm a wackadoodle, then I would say you are ungrateful. Explain how you can't be. Explain how you can be. If someone gave you a, po a possibility for unlimited spiritual wealth, and you're going to sit here and tell me that you don't spend the time to get to know that person and why that is, how is that not showing di uh, no gratitude? How is it not? I mean, if, so if I'm a wackadoodle and I'm a weirdo, then you're an ungrateful person, and you're also being very selfish and self-absorbed. And there are other, other adjectives I can throw on top of that. So I hope that answers the question about this, because that comes up quite a bit with other people outside. So 
now we're on the topic, now we're looking to the last piece of this theophany, the Christophany, which is how the Lord appears, and I say the Lord God appears, as the angel of the Lord. And we took one Friday where um, Greg and Sandy were, were there, and it was recorded just the four of us, me, babes, and Greg and Sandy. And then we, it was on, it was on the, it's online on the video. But we did a special uh, session on that where we, I guess some folks thought we weren't going to have Friday study. It was Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> and we did, and we did. Sorry about that. I was asking if we weren't going to, and no one really kind of gave me an indication either way. So I figured, so I, figured I, I, I did anyway. So, so I did. So that's online. Um, that's online from Friday. And what we talked about was how the angel of the Lord is, is, a, is a word picture of the Spirit of Christ. Okay? So the, this Holy Spirit is the, is the Spirit of God the Father. And then the angel of the Lord is the Spirit of, of, of God the Son. To make that uh, long, lengthy lesson short and abbreviated, uh, what we're at in the topic of this is to reprise and where we've been and let you know, lastly, to get back to the topic of where we are, is to let us know about what this really means and why the phrasing, the angel of the Lord. Now, our Joe Witness friends, again, it bears witness to say that, no pun intended, that they think that, that Jesus was an angel who was then become, you know, God, became who he was. Particularly, they think he's Michael the archangel who became manifested as Jesus. However, uh, we have John Calvin and Matthew Henry we saw before that are well-known names John Calvin from the Reformation period, and Matthew Henry from the Common Era, who wrote, writes commentaries, uh, particularly to the Southern Baptists, anybody who's lordship, salvation oriented and the general Christianity, churchianity movement will know who Matthew Henry is. They both believe that the angel of the Lord is a reference to Michael the Archangel. However, we know that your witnesses think that he is Michael the Archangel, who then became Jesus. So it's a dangerous, slippery slope when you get down that path. But what we have seen so far in the study is, first of all, the reason why God the Son, Jesus, God Almighty, and the person of God the Son would be called that. You say, why would God want to call himself an angel? Because it's the angel of the Lord. And it references, why that? Because it references the spiritual flesh from which the, the form of the Spirit of Christ comes in an angelic sense because it has spiritual flesh. Because we saw how angelic hosts in Jude 6 and 7 have spiritual flesh. Because if they didn't, then Jude would never have used the phrase heterox flesh that they went after. Which means we get our word heterosexual from that different from which means they do have flesh, but it's not like ours. There is no blood coursing through their veins, just like there's no blood coursing through the Spirit of Christ, just like there's no blood coursing through when he was risen from the dead. There is an unknown type of spiritual flesh that the, angel, that, that, that the Spirit of Christ takes on, and it's likened unto an angelic form, and therefore they would call the Spirit of Christ when he appears the angel of the Lord. And there is your reference as to why the angel term is used, or the messenger of the Lord. Okay? All right, now, with that being said, we go back to where we are. And again, the uh, angel of the Lord focuses in on the authority of Yahweh, the Lord. Whereas when you see the phrase, the angel of Elohim, it focuses in on the deity of who he is. So one's his authority and one's his deity. Because there's a difference in both phrases being used. And that goes back to Sister Tracy's comment about, and the evidence of this is what God started the whole scripture with when he said in Genesis 1 that it was Elohim who created and restored all these things. But then in chapter 2, he's Chave Elohim. Well, why did he change his name? Well, because he didn't. He just added to his character to show now the authority piece of him comes into play, not just his deity and creator being, but now the authority comes into play because now he has a being from which he's making accountable and responsible, i.e. us. All right? And so because of that, that's why Chave comes in because it always brings up an accountability and responsibility. Whereas Elohim always brings up the creator deity piece of who he is, all right? So with that being said, uh, we're now caught up to this piece of the angel of the Lord, what we're talking about. And we're looking at the fact that there's all these scriptures on the board here on this piece deal with that issue. And we saw that angels do not receive worship. We saw that clearly in Revelation 19 and 10 and 22, 8 to 9. And so therefore, when you see folks who worship the angel of the Lord, and he does not correct them, it's evidence A, that again, this is God the Son at Christophany. Second evidence is because he, he calls himself that he's the Lord Almighty. Third evidence is because connecting scriptures together from previous mention or after mentioning, they also, they, the person experiencing, calls himself that. So you're like, whoa, because the person calling the, calling the uh, angel of the Lord, who God, God Almighty, the angel of the Lord himself called himself God Almighty, and then people worship him. So those are the evidences as to why we're saying the angel of the Lord is, in fact, a Christophany of God the Son. So 
And we saw earlier, and, and to uh, Sister uh, Nancy's point too, we saw that he appears with Gideon first, with the angel of the Lord with a sword. And then he appears, uh, was that first, sorry, second, excuse me, first with Joshua, then Gideon. So two times where an angel of the Lord appears with a sword in his hand, and it's to Joshua first, and then to Gideon. And he calls himself the general of the armies of the Chave Sabaoth. You're like, <laughs> so he calls himself like a heavy hit. Not only is he, not only is Jesus God the Son, God Almighty, but he calls himself like the head of all the angels, which is always no shock because all authority is given to him. It shouldn't surprise us that that headship of God, of the, of the Godhead, God the Son, heads up all the angelic host. So you would imagine that God the Father is probably in charge of the seraphim, four living ones, and the 24 elders, but the angelic hosts are in charge of by God the Son. That's what it makes it sound like to me. So, so when you look at that process of it, we, we saw also from last time we studied that in, in Revelation 10, there's an angel that's described that's, that's really powerful. A rainbow and a cloud and all this different majesticness about this another strong angel. Then in also in Revelation 20, we saw that Jesus says he has his own angel. And you're like, is that that guy? <laughs> so it makes you really go, hmm, because it's really interesting and fascinating. That's in Revelation uh, 20, 16, I think it was, where Jesus says he has his own angel. I can't remember where I put that on the board here. I can't remember anymore. Um, anyway, yes? John said, what about the angel at the entrance into the Garden of Eden with a flaming sword? Okay, he I know said, you're going to... isn't that a cherubim and not an angel? Great. I'm glad you mentioned that because I almost forgot and overlooked it because we talked about it offline uh, last time with Sister Nancy Harbour. And so let's go back and I'll read that to you. You read it carefully, you'll find that that's not the case that they did not have a sword. Let me read it carefully to you. It's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So he drove out the man, which is God, Elohim, Chave Elohim, drove out the man, Ha'adam, and he placed or tabernacled at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubims, plural, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So if you look at it carefully, the flaming sword is not in the hand of the cherubim, by no means. It's accompanying them. So it's almost as if, for example, he took his, his sword and went shoom, in the ground. And he said, cherubim, you guard the way. And they're like, oh, I'm not going there. Because if God himself, you imagine, the king of kings goes shoom, in the ground with a sword and he gets it on fire. And then cherubim around it going, who goes there? Nobody. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. You know, I'm not going to go back there. There's no way. You just got, remember the cherubim. They, face of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a man. Are you serious? The, 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 the wings they got going on, the gyroscope underneath their, their, their feet with eyes in it, that's an eerie looking creature, dude. And then you got that, you got two of those. Well, I should say at least two, it's plural. You don't know there's two. There could be more than two. It's at least two, because it's plural. And there's this flaming sword that you, you know is put there by God Almighty. I mean, because it doesn't say it's in their hand, they wield it, it doesn't say that. So that's the great comment you made, but it's different from the angel that wields the sword to, in Joshua's account, in Joshua 5, as well as in Gideon's account um, as well. I said Gideon. I said Gideon. My mistake. I say in Gideon 4. Balaam. Goodness gracious. What is wrong with me? Balaam is the one who the angel of the Lord with the sword. My apologies. I want to say in Gideon. My apologies. My apologies. I think I'm getting Gideon because I know why. Okay. Because in Balaam's case, the first occurrence of the angel of the Lord has a sword in his hand with the donkey. Then you had Joshua, but then you had the Gideon where later on he, the angel comes down and slays the Assyrians. And that's the inference to the sword there as well. That's where that comes from. My apologies. That's later on. So I, I apologize. I didn't say, you shouldn't say Gideon, but it's later on after Gideon, the times of the kings. So, so anyways, uh, as we look at, at, at this process, uh, we'll see where we left off. I was going to mention to you. Okay. So the angel of the Lord speaks and the previous mentionings. The first time we see on all these records of when the angel of the Lord appears is only the first time he does that was with, again, with the sword unto uh, Balaam. I don't want to say Gideon again. Balaam. And then also second time is Joshua. Third time we see is with Gideon. Then it was Gideon there. And then fourth time was with Samson's mom and dad, if you remember. Fifth time was with David at the threshing floor. And then the sixth time was with Elijah by the juniper tree. So we have six appearances that we see of the angel of the Lord. But we do have other references where he speaks. 
he speaks to Hagar first and Ishmael and then Abram, right? So we do see he speaks before this, but the first time we see him appear is again in referencing to first it's Balaam, then it's Joshua, then it's Gideon, then it's Samson's mom and dad, then it's David, and then it's Elijah. So then we go onwardly and we saw that in 2 Kings we left off with Elijah two times and he speaks to him and in 2 Kings 19.35 he destroys 185 Assyrians. So let's go to that uh, reference there. We can catch back up to where we are now. So in 2 Kings, uh, we saw the first one already, but 2 Kings 19.35, let's go there. 2 Kings 19.35. I hope I'm not talking too fast at a fast clip. I kind of want to catch myself with that. We're covering a lot of ground. And the more I realize, what I just said, for example, would be most people's homily or message, and they'd be done, everybody would go home right now. You think about it. Right? Well, that's true. Oh, really? So it, most messages last about shorter or as long as what I just did just now, and then they're done. They go home. Just, just imagine that. Most people right now in church unity are already dis disembarking. They're already done. They're disengaged, and we're just now digging in. <laughs> it's pretty interesting to think about that. So most folks who, it's like, it's, like, it's like most people like me who go to do a little tiny workout of five minutes, and here's Ryan doing it for an hour and a half. I wonder why he's more, you know, ripped than I am, right? So is he puts more effort into it, much more time, much more energy. Yes? Can you try to say the verse again? Uh, 2 Kings 19, verse 35. So 2 Kings 19, verse 35, and it says, And it came to pass that night, when the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000, and they arose early in the morning. Behold, they were all dead carcasses. Now, it's inferred here that maybe did it with a sword, but it's not mentioned specifically. What's also more of an important issue is that throughout all the times of my life growing up in Christianity, uh, since I knew the Lord, since I was, uh, well, I knew him before, but I was walking with the Lord since I was 20, I always thought this was a reference to just an angel. Because of the study we've been studying about the angel of the Lord and knowing how this is transpiring, we, I realize now this is actually uh, the Spirit of Christ who did this. So you're like, yowza. Um, that's pretty amazing. So, <clears throat> so when you, when you see this phrasing, it's, it's pretty, pretty awe-inspiring. Tracy said 2 Kings 19, 35. Yes. Yes. And Todd said, how do you answer the comment that God gave the Ten Commandments saying, thou shalt not kill? Great question. Well, it's the same. <laughs> no, it's the same, same question. It's, it's a great question. Um, it's the same question, by the way, that I would ask people to bring up the objection. I'll bring, I'll bring up another, you know what, I'll, I'll receive your objection, and I, will, and I will raise the objection even greater. You think that's a, a conundrum? I got a bigger one for you. Why would God not kill Cain in Genesis chapter 4, but he tells no one in chapter, chapter 9, when a man sheds a man's blood, so shall his blood be shed. What's up with that? You just said to Noah, ever kill somebody, you take them out. But yet you didn't do it with Cain. So I'm going to raise the ante on your comment. So the answer to both is the same answer. You know what the answer is? Man has no right to question how and why we do things, and that's why the Ten Commandments were given. The Ten Commandments were given, and the other 603 to boot, because remember, there's 613 commandments total, by the way. Our Catholic friends, God love them, they mean well, but they think there's only 10 commandments. They wish. There's 10 that embody the character of God, but there's another 603 that God added in dietary, governmental, and other social issues. It's, there's a 613 of them, and Jesus kept them all. Every single one. He didn't fail in one of them. Because remember, if he did, according to James chapter 3, he fails in them all. He can't do that, because he's the truth, Jack. So somebody says, how you know he kept them all? Because of what I just said. That's how I know. He kept them all. So the Ten Commandments represent just the embodiment of what the other 610 are based on. It's, it's the heart and soul of what the other 610 come out of that premise. But they are basically other aspects of dietary, social, and governmental. Yes? Um, 
said, same number as the seeds in the pomegranate, uh, which were hung on the hem of the priest's the priest garments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a bell and a pomegranate, yeah. Interesting. I didn't know about that being the same number of seeds. That's pretty interesting stuff. Interesting. And the pomegranate's a purple fruit. And the high priest who went in is of a high stewardship role, picturing a steward amongst those who have, who have the truth within truth. So what, I, what irony is that? So she that's so cool. It is so cool. Um, plus also, by the way, pomegranates in a, in a physical, nutritional sense of it, by the way, did you know pomegranates increase blood flow? Did you know that? Which is why they were the aphrodisiacs of the day. They called them mandrakes. They increased blood flow, not to get grotesque or get ornery, but just to be honest with you. If you increase blood flow in a man, then certain areas of his physical body will be aroused, if you will. God forbid, I'm going to get sacrilegious here. But that's why they said mandrakes or pomegranates were used in that way. In a spiritual sense, think about that. In a spiritual sense, if you increase blood flow, you're increasing the life of the blood of Christ in your life, increasing his influence in your life by the precious blood that saved you. You're increasing more of that saving grace of God to inspire your mind, heart, spirit. Yes? I, Pam said, juice of the pomegranate is blood red. Yep. The blood red. Song yeah. of Solomon. What's that? Mandrakes in the yeah, Song of Solomon. Yeah, they're an aphrodisiac. But the, yes, the, the fruit is blood red. So the fruit itself may be a purplish color, but the juice of it is blood red. What's that? That was Leah, his mom, because she wanted to get back to Rachel, who was his apple of his eye, but she was the slighted one, so she wanted to at least do the one thing that she couldn't do, which is give him children. She can't give him the same um, look in his eye, but she can definitely give him a sense of you know, value that she's got more kids than Rachel has brought him, which she did. But let's not mistake it, who are the two most powerful kids of all the 12? <laughs> Benjamin and Joseph, and who bore those? Rachel, so nice try, Leah. You know, you do have more kids, but her two were quality, not quantity that mattered. <laughs> so, 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 anyway, so if we go back to, um, I forgot what I was saying now. So we go back to, oh, oh, so your question about the Ten Commandments. So, so the reason why, again, he could say that someone can, he could kill the Assyrians, and even though he says don't kill, is because God's not subjected and regulated to the, the Ten Commandments that he gives to us. So why were the Ten Commandments given that say do not kill? They were given for us for two reasons. One, and this is, by the way, it's going to be in our doctrinal statement, just so you know. Number one, it's because God wants to show our depraved nature how different it is from God's divine nature. God's divine nature is expressed in those Ten Commandments. That He is the only God there is. You should have no other God before Him. You should not take His name in vain. You should not kill. He's talking about His, because He is a God of life. And only He can take life and give life. And that's why we don't have the right to take it, because we can't give it. He who gives it can take it. Can you give life? Women go, yeah, I do from my womb. Da, stop it. You did not make a soul. <laughs> all you did was bore, all you did was bear a physical thing that grew inside of you that we call a fetus, then calls a baby. You did not make the fetus. Tell you what, when you can actually show me, go on a sonogram chart, and I'm gonna I'm gonna track when sperm hits egg, you show me, you go, okay, what? There's a nose, see? There's the mouth. When you start doing that, and you can show me exactly what you do that makes that child's form, his body, his mind, his soul, his blood, his vessels, his nerve system, and you show me that then I'll believe you give life. Otherwise, psh. by the way, if I'm a manufacturer of widgets and I sell widgets to GM and I say, here, you can make a car with these widgets, but you cannot make a car, only one premise. You can make whatever you want. You can make a short car, long car, big car, tall car, fast car, slow car, truck. I don't question, but you cannot do intrinsic harm to people and the environment. That's part of the deal. There's a whole harmless agreement. As long as you don't do evil with this widget, you can do what you want with it. Now, I'm the one who sold the part to the manufacturer. Now, the manufacturer of GM's cars can make anything they want as long as they don't do harm to people in the environment, right? So I do that. So I say that. So if they, if they, if they go and do that, don't I have a, a legal clause to bring suit against them? Wait a minute. You signed the contract, dude. You don't have a right. You're, you're the fact. You can make what you want. You can put out the product, you, you control the product line, what goes out of that factory, no doubt about it. You control what comes out of the factory, you do. You control, a woman controls what goes out of the factory. You do control what goes out of that factory, what goes on the, what goes on, out, out to the dealership. But didn't we sign a deal that you have to hold harmless? You cannot take what I gave you as a resource from which to make said vehicle, 
and, and to, 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 to manufacture it, to have it be, a, you're, 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 you're the factory inside. Matter of fact, all the factory workers are mine. They all work for me. They all are trained because of what I told them. Without my factory workers and my, my widget, you can't make a car. And so because of that, you have to do it the way I tell you to do it. So when you violate that, I have a legal recourse against you. Do I not? So what right does a woman have to say, I can have a right to give and take life? No, you don't. No more in that example, that person has a right to do that which is against our agreement. You can't harm a person or the environment. How are you not harming a person or the environment when you kill a child in the womb? You are. You're the same analogy. I, God gave you the widget. God gave you the, the, the sperm and the egg. He, gave, he created the soul. Right? That's the widget. And God was the factory assembly line in place as his hand was forging all those things. You didn't do it. You didn't provide the soul, nor did you forge the image of that child in that likeness. No, you didn't. Stop lying. No, you didn't. All you were was the factory. You were the conduit from which he's then, he or she's then brought out of the assembly line to the dealership <laughs> of life. So when you do a whole harmless agreement with God, which is God saying, you don't have to sign an agreement. He signs it with us unilaterally. He says, you will value life. You do not take life because you didn't take it because you didn't give it. When you give it, you can take it. Until you do, that you don't take life. Unless I tell you to, under circumstances, I tell you when to. Because then God will tell you to. As the author of life, he can tell you when to do that and how to do that. You have to do it when he says it, how he says it, and to who he says it, and do it immediately. You can't, like, and of course, Saul learned that lesson. You can't bring back the Amalekite king and go, well, I meant to kill him later so all people could see him. God said, kill him in battle. What part of your deaf ears didn't hear that? Oh, you wanted to have the arrogant display of pride to look at me and pound your chest like a little testosterone guy. No. You can't just do what God says how it makes you look good. Sometimes you got to do it when you get no praise and glory for it. You know what? It's not about you. It's about his justice being upheld. So when God takes a life, he can because he's the giver of life. Secondly, because it upholds his own venue of justice and because he has a right to. So that's how I, I, I say the Ten Commandments are given as, number one, an example of God's character of righteousness to expose our character of darkness. <clears throat> Secondly, the Ten Commandments are given for the second reason, which is to teach us the principle of obedience and disobedience, and along with it comes consequences and rewards. That's what it's supposed to teach us. That one, we can't measure up to God's character, and two, if we do what God says, we're going to get rewarded for it, but if we don't, oh, we get chastised. That's no, that principle hasn't changed, <laughs> by the way. This is how God does it. So same thing. The Ten Commandments are what Jesus was about. Jesus was about the embodiment of God's character, showing you that we're not him. And number two, what did Jesus teach? If you obey me, I'll bless you. And if you don't, I'll hold you accountable. Nothing's changed. That's why he was the embodiment of the word of God. He is the living word. He fulfilled the law. He is. The law is within him. That's why he can say, I'm the, I'm the plumb line. The pedagogue was the law to lead you to me. Because that was just the written word. I'm the living word. I'm living it. I'm the meat on the bones of that skeleton that was given to you. You were in medical class these 2,000 years, seen a skeleton. Let me show you where the bones and sinew and nerve system all joined together. And you're like, what's well, fascinating? I know. He's like, I know. I know. <laughs> so you're like, well, because he made us. So of course he's going to tell us. He's, the, you know, he's like you learn from a book, and all of a sudden the teacher comes in the class and goes, okay, students, let me explain to you what you're reading. And you're like, that means what? Like, yeah. But now you have a teacher to expound for you what you're reading. You didn't know what it meant until he comes around going, oh, by the way. So that's why, why would you go back and honor the book over the teacher who expounded the book, who actually wrote the book? You must be ignorant. To honor the law above Jesus makes you a total ignorant person. I'm sorry, but you just are. Because you're honoring a book over the teacher who wrote the book and who expounded the book. That makes zero sense. Would you go to a seminar with an author who wrote a book to hear him talk about the book, and then while he's talking, go outside on break and read the book the entire time? You're dumb. You are dumb to do that. Why spend the money? Why even attend if that's what you're going to do? Why even go there? Makes no sense. The reason that you would go there because you want to see the guy who wrote the book or the gal who wrote the book. You want to see that human, that gal or that guy, and get insight as to why they wrote what they wrote. To expound on what they wrote that wasn't in the pages of what they wrote. And to ask questions about what they wrote because you have questions about what, what, what it meant to you. So, duh, so you, it's just common sense, right? So it's amazing how, how we don't see the Lord that way, but we should. I'm trying to make practical, applicational stories here and, and analogies so we can get the purpose and premise behind that question. Because again, God is the giver, the giver of life and taker of life. Because he can give. Since he gives it, he can take it. Since he wrote a commandment was to us to just see his holiness and secondly to live obediently or have, have blessings for what or consequences for not doing it. Therefore, 
the do not kill aspect was not according unto him, but according unto us. And that's why also with Cain, he did not kill him because that was his right not to do so because he gets clemency where he wants. He'll give it where he wants. Just like of the 12 apostles, he chose Judas as the one to betray him. The other ones took a deep sigh of relief and go, whew, thank God it wasn't me. <laughs> you know, because it could have been any of them. But he chose Judas before time because God gives clemency who he wants. I, I read that somewhere. Oh, that's right. Unto Pharaoh, I will harden who I will harden. I will give compassion who I give compassion. Pharaoh, I raised you up for my purpose. John 8, why is that man born blind, Jesus? Because I decide who sees and who doesn't see. And I decide when. That sounds kind of arrogant, Jesus. And your point is, what's that you don't like me? And you're, what's that? I could make you drop dead right now. Be careful what you say. <laughs> They're like, no, we're good. We're good. We're good. So he was born blind. What, for what reason again? His mom and dad something? No, 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 no. He, he wasn't a reincarnated person, did something bad. Not, not, not that Hindu stuff. His mom and dad did nothing bad, nothing like that. He's just born blind for the glory of God. Whoa, 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 whoa. You mean to tell me he was born blind? Because all through time, you could just come by and go, oh, and give him sight to have all the attention on you to prove that you're God Almighty. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Seems kind of selfish, don't you think, God? And God goes, and your point is, when is my creation about you? When? When did I say it was about you? When did I say that? Did I ever say to you that your name was more powerful than any other name? Did I say that your purpose in life was more powerful than my purpose in life? Where, where did I put you ahead of me? When, when did that ever happen? When? Oh, that's right. When I died for you. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's the only time. So won't you give some respect and read my book? Hello. <laughs> yeah, I did it the one time when I let you beat me and scourge me and disdain me and spit on me and then murder me, and yet you have no, you have no common sense to say thanks to read my book. Thanks for bringing it up, by the way. You're right. That is kind of selfish of me, huh? The almighty God who gave you life, who went through all that for you, and you can't take the time to find out about me. And you have the audacity to say, what's the purpose, as long as I believe? That you want to challenge me when I do what I do. That makes no sense. You're an ingrate. That's what you are. Anyway, hope answers your question. So a little off topic, as usual, when I do that. I go on little bat rabbit trails. So then we go, as we look in, uh, into Psalm, or not Psalm, First Chronicles. Go to First Chronicles. First Chronicles and chapter one, verse eleven and twelve. Again, when I said earlier about God giving clemency to Cain, think about it. If a man sheds another man's blood, back in Noah's day, Noah didn't have the right to give clemency unless God said so. Only God can go against the hard, fast rule when He wants to, because He's the one who He who made the rules, right? He can break the rules all day long. You say, well, that makes no sense. Sure it does. Doesn't doesn't the firstborn? He says the one who gets blessed, but He didn't do it with Jacob and Esau that way. He blessed the second one. Same with Zerah and Perez. Same with Ephraim and Phimnasa. He can do whatever he wants to defy Isaac and Ishmael. Same thing. He, can, he does it four times right there. I just told you. Where he, but he also says, but in the, to Jews, the firstborn gets double portion. And they could say, but that's not what happened with, um, um, wait a minute, Cain, Abel, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Zerah, Perez, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Hey, what gives? He's like, you questioning me? I do what I please. This is a law for you, not for me. Okay? The law was for you, not for me. The law was to exhibit to you my character so you can actually do what you need to do because you can't be left to your own devices. You're too doofus-like. i got to tell you what to do or else you'll be destroying yourself. Would you just really? That's why even in this, this timeline of by grace through faith we live, by the grace of the Son of God, even now he gives us a book to live by. If you take this book away, it, I mean, all we have, we have something left was the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit, but he uses the book to bring us to conviction, to bring us to enlightenment. It's kind of somewhat helpful, but that's not, you're going to find out in tribulation what's going to happen when that happens. It's bad. Yeah. That's why he destroys the Bibles. He destroys them, the Antichrist does, because he knows that without this book to reference, the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit need this to reference. They bring us back to this. Because they know that, they know the psalmist is right. When you forget, you got to go back and read it. You got to go back and study it. And if you don't have it to go back and reference, you can be helped, but only in a general sense, not to an absolute sense. It's almost like saying, I get, I get injured and I go to your hospital where you work and you can treat me. Versus we're out in the wild and we're on an island and I get hurt. I go, help me. You go, um, <laughs> I don't have the resources. I got the knowledge, but I don't have the resources to draw from to help you. That's what this is the resource to draw from to help us. So the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ are going to heal and help and encourage and counsel us by all means, with or without the book. They could do a much better job with the book. <laughs> they bring us back to it to heal us, to help us. There's a resource. Yes. Remember the dark ages. Yeah. Of course, what, Penn, Bell, and Everdale, and Hood. 
Yeah. How about the Central America program where they said? Well, because remember, and, and, that, and that's in our timeline too. I did a product timeline. That's in, I put that in. They're going to have, the, because they're going to be infused with the psalmist David. This is why they can't. Remember, only they are unique. Those 144,000 Sumeticoi people are going to be infused, like David said, my word I've hidden in my heart. I won't, no, I won't sin against you. They're going to be like little Jack Van Impies. They're going to have the whole scripture memorized. But they and themselves, so about yeah, but they, but them and the, they and themselves didn't do that. Yeah. God empowered them with that. God in, infused it into their heart, mind, and soul and spirit. So they just know it like this. And not just the words, they know the expounded definitions. <laughs> and that's why everybody commands their respect. They command, they command their respect. They're like, dude, you should hear that guy over there. He's, he can tell you what the verse means, where it came from, what it references. Does he have a Bible? No, he, he is a Bible. <laughs> you gotta go talk to that guy. He's unbelievable. That gal over there, that guy, that, that Susie Q girl, boy, she is unbelievable. You should talk to her. And they're like, well, the demon's coming after me. I know they're gonna kill you, but hey, you can't stop that, but hey, you can learn in the meantime. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, those guys can't be killed, but the other people can be, and they will be. So, anyway, I digress. So, First Corinthians, First Chronicles, chapter twenty-one. I get off on rabbit trails. First Chronicles twenty-one. Sorry about that. First Chronicles twenty-one, and we're looking in verse uh, twelve to thirty. So, First Chronicles twenty-one. He's recounting uh, the works of God as the angel of the Lord. So, First Chronicles. In chapter 12, chapter 21, excuse me, chapter 21, verse, verse 12, well, verse 11, actually. So, so Gad came to David and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, choose to take either three years' famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while thy sword of the enemies overtake you, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast of Israel. And now, therefore, advise thyself that word. I shall bring again him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Let me fall now in the hand, into the hand of the Lord, Kave. For, the, for, great, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hands of man. So Kave, the Lord, gave pestilence upon Israel, and there fell on Israel 70,000 men. And Elohim sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And he was destroying, the Lord beheld, while he, while he, while he was destroying, the Lord beheld, Chave beheld and saw, and he repented or sighed him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord, of Chave, stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, and David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord. Does she know the previous mentioning in verse 15 is the same referencing of the angel of the Lord because he references it with the context as the same. Now watch this, he says. Saul, and David lifted his eyes in verse 16, saw the angel of the Lord, Kave, standing between the earth and the heavens, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. Sounds like worship to me. And David said unto God, Elohim, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Chave, my God, Elohim, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. And the, then the angel of the Lord commanded to Gad to say to David, the angel of Chave, that David should go up and set, and set up an altar unto, the, unto Chave and the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up and sang of, a saying of Gad, which he spoke in the name of Chave the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. That means they were scared stiff, right? Now Ornan was threshing wheat, and as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his nostrils to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build a sacrifice altar therein unto the Lord Chave. Thou shalt grant me Grant it to me for the full price of the silver, that the plague may be stayed from thy people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let thy Lord Adonai, thy king, work that which is good in his eyes. And see, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offering, and threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat and the meat for meat, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And the king David said to Ornan, Nay, but in chattling I will verily buy, and I for the full price of the silver, for I will not take that which is in thine for the Lord, for Chave nor burn offerings without cost or, grat or gratuitousness. 
So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there a sacrifice altar unto the Lord Chaveh, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord Chaveh, and answered him from the heavens by fire upon sacrifice altar of burnt offerings. And the Lord Chaveh the, said to the angel, and, put up, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him, Chaveh had answered him, and the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of Chaveh, the Lord, which Moses made in the wilderness, and sacrificed all to the burnt offerings, were at the season in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God Elohim, for he was afraid, frightened, because of the face of the sword of the angel of the Lord, Chaveh. Frightened, <laughs> fearful of God and his appearance that he would give. So you see a recounting of the works of God, and you see it mentioned in verse 12, 15, 16, 18, and then down to um, verse 20 and verse 30. This angel, well, verse 27 as well. So we do see this mentioning um, on this reference there. Now we go to the Psalms. So we don't see, now in this case, by the way, this is an appearance as well. I should put an appearance here. So what you already have right here, that's, that's actually, recount. I'm not going to count it again because this is recounting what we already saw here, which I'm going to put up here, right here. He's recounting what happened here, if you remember. See, he appeared to him on the threshing floor. He's just recounting it in First Chronicles, basically reprising the story. Yeah, so Satan goes him. So, so basically, um, if you look into verse three, and, and Job answered the Lord, "Make to this people a hundred times so more as they may be, as they may be." But the Lord, the King, as as are are they not all my Lord's servants? When does when does my Lord require these things? When will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? So, so nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, whereas Job had departed. And so, so, and verse five, and Joab gave the number of the of the people unto David. And they were hundred. So basically, David's numbering the people for a sense of taxes, if you will, to gain revenue from how many people are there, which is what you're not supposed to do, obviously. So he wants to know who's over here, who's over here, who's over here. That's not your business. They're not your people. They're my people, God would say. So let them be in their tribes as they, as they camp. Don't you go trying to figure out how much you can get from this and this and this. That's what he was basically doing. He wanted to have recourse given back for them to give back to. And there, that's the problem is that, like for all of us, to give an example for all of us, the perfect example is I'm not supposed to, by the way, denominations do this. You go to a domination and, and they'll have you sign a form that says, please put down what you make for a living and we'll send you what your tithe should be. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They do that to this day. Churchianity people do that. They say, what's your income? Your tithe should be this. We'll give you a report of how you're doing per quarter. So you're saying you're making blank, you're giving blank, where is the other extra? And it's really condescending. So they put this law aspect in your face. Whereas Corinthians says God loves a cheerful giver. So you're supposed to give to where God blesses you. So that should be something innately between you and God. Between you and God, between you and God. That's nothing to do with me. So however, but if I said to you, hey, you need to do that, I can't do that. That's not my place. Now, because ultimately God's the one who provides, in David's case, for the kingdom's welfare not David, God does. So therefore, but God's using David to be the one who's the conduit to which to run his kingdom. And so therefore, when he starts numbering the people for benefit to see by faith, see by sight instead of by faith, God provides, God brings to the storehouse what he needs. It, it's difficult to do that. I'll be honest with you, it is. It is for me too. Because there's times when I, I don't, I don't want to say, I don't say things, but there's a fine between a responsibility of reporting things versus that's one thing. That way God can lead you as he leads you. But the difference between saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to tell you what you should do, or I'm, gonna, I'm going to find out about more about you so I can then maybe you know, influence you what to do. That's, that's not good. Let you, be, let you be in the hands of God and, and trusting him as my number one responsibility, like it was David's, that he would provide. And number two is to inform you how God's provision is, is being done so that in those two things, God glorified. That he still moves on, on me as he moves on you. He influences me as he influences you. That's an, independent, that's an independent thing. It's not for me to get involved in that. So Satan was goading him, saying, hey, do you really trust God's going to bring stuff to the storehouse? I mean, you do need some stuff over here. 
find out what the people have to give. Maybe you can have them. But that's not the, he thought nothing wrong with that. It makes sense. Cause from a government standpoint of humanity, that makes sense. Let folks know. And t Satan's good about that, making you take a, a principle of, of man's government and infuse it into God's world and say, if it's okay with man and business, eh, well, we all do that. Just do it in God's government. God goes, don't bring that in. You don't do that. It's a house of prayer. You don't bring in that malarkey garbage of monetary things. I provide that stuff. So he influences you to give what you give. He influences me to trust in him for that. He influences me to inform you that he influences you to take what you need for that information to do what you need to do. I, we're all in this in the same premise, trusting the God. That's gonna, what's, whatever you give, trusting enough, that's what it is. That's what God gave you because it comes down to being a cheerful giver. I'm not supposed to dictate that, 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 that to you. No, I'm not supposed to, uh, how, how do you want to say, I'm not supposed to uh, uh, set up a stage to where I can actually um, manipulate that. I'm not supposed to dictate or manipulate it. I'm not supposed to do, but people do both. They dictate on a small degree, but the majority of them manipulate. They'll, they'll say, oh, God could give you a, a hundredfold blessing for every hundred dollars you give. I'm like, what? That's manipulation. Or if you don't, you're not, you're not doing well because you're not giving. That's not true. People, people say all kinds of stuff that makes people get, feel guilty. They manipulate their, their, their willingness to give. And all you should do is trust in God, me and you both, and secondly, respond to the needs. You and me both. Me by making you aware of where we're at and you by just moving where God moves you in your life. I can't, you know what I mean? That's what David had to be challenged with. That's what was going on. Yes, sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes, babe. Tom had said, I never had seen this account in the Bible. And Pam said, so much for the Muslims claim to the Temple Mount. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, so much for that, right? So let's go to um, Psalm 34, 7. Psalm 34, 7. What's that? Psalm 34, 7? Well, 34. Yeah, 34, okay. That's a long one. <laughs> Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord Kave encamped around them, encamped around them about them that fear him and delivered them. How cool is that? That's an awesome verse to memorize. Put that in the back of your quiver. That the Spirit of Christ encompasses you when you fear him, and he will deliver you. Oh, oh, oh take that one to the bank, Jack. <laughs> I, want, I want that one. I want that one all day long. <laughs> I, want that. That's a, I, I like that one. So as long as I live in fear, healthy fear, not in, you know, oh, oh, oh. no, in fear of, Reverence, and I reverence God. I respect. I have a deep sense of respect and value to God. If I have that, and I show that by my actions, by my by wanting to seek Him out and be a worthy servant and child of Him, then He's going he's to deliver me. Because he's going to be encompassed around me. How how awesome is that? I love it. I love it. All right. So, so then you go to Psalm 35, verses five and six. Let them be as chaff at the face of the wind. In an overthrowing, let the angel of the Lord have overthrow them, chase them. Let, let their way be dark and slippery. And let the angel of the Lord have persecute them. Wow. So remember who the chaff are, remember? Those are folks that are in sperma that live with a sense of unreconciled behavior, unsanctified behavior. They don't go on in sanctification and reconciliation. They simply take a flippant approach to what God has given them. They believe that since they have another measure of understanding that inheritance is different from salvation, what else could there possibly be? That, that's already a big deal. But I learned that there's more than just being saved. There's an inheritance I could gain or lose. I'm in. I'm good. Thank you very much. Check, please. I'm out. No, there's more on the menu, by the way. Thank God you understood there's more than just the main course. There's appetizers. But there's dessert, and you know all that's awesome. But did you know there's different things you can eat, though, by the way? And why would you leave off the chef's specialty? You didn't even know he had that, did you? Oh, I didn't, I, there's a menu. No, but there's different things on it. You have to know the book. And so they will tend to be the chaff. Zechariah, that's the one I want to really focus on, because that's the book that God is emphatic about this phrasing, angel of the Lord. Zechariah is the most emphatic book where this, is, this phrasing is used by, by far. 
So Zechariah chapter 1. It's, always, it's used in majority in the prophetic sense. Zechariah chapter 1. I'll read for context. I'll read verse 9 as well. Chapter 1, verse 9. Then said, then said I, O my Lord Adonai. Zechariah 1, verse 9. Then said I, O my Adonai, my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man stood among the myrtle trees, answered and said, These are, the, these are they whom the Lord Chave had sent to walk to and fro from the earth. And they answered, The angel of the Lord Chave, that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro from the earth. And behold, all the earth sits still and is at rest. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord Chave answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem? And on the cities of Judah, against thou, against which thou hast had indignation, been enraged these seventy years. And the Lord Chave answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel, verse 14, that communed with me, said unto me, Cry thou out, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yabaoth, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. So there's your issue of Oprah's ignorance of what jealousy means. God is a jealous God because he demands to have the respect and honor what's due him for what he has given. He is jealous of that which belongs to him. He gave them an existence and a life. He deserves to have their praise and adoration. Does he not? That's why he said, I'm greatly jealous. That's, those are my people. But that's my land. That's my people. I marked out of everything on this planet and everyone on this planet. I marked that place and those people out. I, I demand some respect and some value, and I will not let someone just trample over them unless I say so. So we can see more of that, but you go onward to chapter 3, verse 1. And he showed me Yahshua. It says Joshua in the uh, actual King James, but it's Yahshua, the same word that, by the way, Joshua in English is the transliteration of Yahshua, which is Jesus' name, which both mean salvation. So when you read the book of Joshua, think of Yahshua, uh, which is interesting about Jesus because it's the same word, just different Hebrew and Greek text. But they mean salvation. Yahshua, the high priest, standing before the face of the angel of the Lord, Chave, and Satan, standing at his right hand to oppose him. Yikes. So go down and also in this context, verse 5 and 6. And I said, let them set a fair myrtle upon his head, a turban. So they set a fair myrtle, or I miss a myrtle, a mitri, a turban, upon his head, and clothed or unrobed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord, Chave, stood by. And the angel of the Lord, Chave, protested against Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, if thou shalt walk in my ways, and thou shalt keep my charge, and thou shalt go, thou shalt also judge, excuse me, in my house. And thou shalt also keep my courts. I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Zechariah 12. Well, actually, Zechariah 5, I should say. Zachari I put it on the board here, but there's not, it's not mentioning the angel of the Lord, but it's mentioning the angel. Zechariah 5. Then the angel talked with me and went forth and said unto me, Lift up thine eyes and see what is that gone forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, It's an ephah that goes forth. Verse 10, then said I to the angel that I talked with me, where does thee bear the ephah, carry the ephah? And he said to me, to build it in the house in the land of Shinar, and established, to be established and thereupon her own base. Chapter 6, verse 4, that I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord Adonai? In verse 5 of chapter 6, and the angel answered me and said, these are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord Adonai of all the earth. So you have ongoing references to the angel, but not the angel of the Lord. But as I continue forward, you can go forward and <clears throat> now go to chapter 12. In chapter 12, in verse 8, I have on the board here in verse 8. In that day, the Lord Chave defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem and he, shall, and he that is feeble among him, them all that day 
shall be as David, and the house of David shall, shall be as God Elohim, as the angel of the Lord Chave before, them, before the face of them. It shall come to pass in that day that I shall seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. All right, and that's Zechariah 12.8. So you have this continual, continual, continual ref reference to the angel of the Lord and Zechariah. But again, he speaks to him. There's really not, one would say maybe there's an appearance to him as you can go back to uh, chapter 1 when he says he walked to and fro on the earth. And one could say, well, maybe when it says in verse 13, he talked to him. So there's really not a direct reference to the angel of the, of the, angel of the Lord being the one who was appearing to him. But it says that he did talk with me and he did show me these things. So it's, and there's no direct reference I was reading back and saying, except for in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, um, standing at the right hand, right, right, standing before the face of the angel of the Lord was Joshua, the high priest. But again, that's not the angel of the Lord standing there, except for in, later on in verse 6, he said, the angel of the Lord stood by. So based on what he saw, so. You could say that he appeared to him, but the point being in Zechariah is the most oft used on a consistent basis of this representation. So in Zechariah, which by the way is prophetic, right? So on the prophetic which is which is um, just focus on Jesus. So Zechariah is prophetically focused on Armageddon, which the focus is on Jesus at said time, is the book that has the most emphasis of the angel of the Lord constantly being mentioned as we see. I find that not coincidence in reference to why the angel of the Lord in that sense is speaking of Christ. Yes? How says Zechariah 12, 8, 9 is referring to the second half of the tribulation? Vicky said, who is the man who stood among the muddle in Zechariah 1, 10, um, riding a red horse? Okay, hold on, I'll get you. So, yes, so you're talking about um, Zechariah 12, 8, and 9. Yes, that's looking at the, the midpoint. Yes. He'll destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's not so much the midpoint as it is. It's an emphatic nature of what he has done in times past and what he will do in times present because there'll be the end of the time of the Gentiles, which will end. So the times of the Gentiles where Jerusalem is trodden down by the Gentiles, that ends at Armageddon, at Gog and Magog number two, at that fight. That's when it will end, and that's when he fulfills verse 9 when he says it will come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That will happen in Gog and Magog number 2. So if you were to put an emphasis on chapter 12 verse 9 I would put Gog and Magog 2 which is the end of tribulation not the middle. It's the end. Because that's when he, that time to the Gentiles comes to an end. Because they trodden down Jerusalem all the way through the tribulation. So he can't destroy the nations in the middle because he's still got some more trodden down to do. Because you have the beast and Satan incarnate and doing what he does and there's the second Gog and Magog battle when Jesus comes back so that, that's when that happens now going back to Vicky's question you said chapter um, in chapter 1 the rider on the red horse <clears throat> in verse 8 and I saw so he says in verse up uh, on verse 7 upon the uh, 20th day the 4 and 20th day 24th day 11th month which is the month of Sabbat in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord on Zechariah the son of Barakai Barakiah the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there, were, were there red horses, speckled in white. But I said, oh, my Lord, what are these? And the angel said, so he's talking about, again, he goes on about the prophetic nature, and I saw what these be as a man stood among the myrtle trees. So you're asking me who the man is? Those are whom the Lord is to walk to and fro in the earth. Okay, so is that what you're asking who the man is in verse 10? In verse 10, is this an angel? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know what, I, I have not considered um, whether that would be an angel, a, a representation of, you know, I don't know. I, wanna, I don't want to answer that. This is a very, I wasn't, I'm just, be, I'm just being transparent here. I did not exegete the passage. I was looking for the entire passage, and which, which I'd have to do to figure that part out. Um, I do not know that for certain. But what I was going to tell you was because of me being excited about when I read Zechariah, I was like, dude, we got to do a study on this. Because Zechariah is so involved with so much prof prophetic aspects. Zechariah has been, in my opinion, one of the books that when I read it, I'm going, okay, wait a second. What, what are you saying again? Because he says a lot of stuff that I don't want to say something now that when I study it, it comes out to be something different. My knee-jerk reaction is to, without doing the exegetical study of the entire chapter or book, is that he's talking about the prophetic nature of the unfolding of Satan through the, uh, the horsemen of the revelation, uh, tribulation, excuse me, a uh, tribulation. However, Ken who said verse 11, Vicki said verse 11 has the angel of the Lord is in the myrtle trees and, and said, right, and Vicki said, I have always been confused by this. Yeah, I know, it's because it, it speaks, I know. So, so yeah, the man that stood in verse 10 seems to be the man who's standing there, but then the question becomes if the Spirit of Christ is standing in the midst of the red horse and the other speckled in the bay one, then if that's, if that's picturing tribulation, then what's going on? That's where it tends, it seems to fall apart. So I'm gonna I want to really do some study on it. I know from what you just said, verse 10, 11. Yes, I can see how the angel of the Lord is representative of the, of the man standing in the midst, but the question still bears to understand what does it all mean in the context of the red horse and the other horses with that says in verse nine that are with uh, verse eight. Excuse me. There, the, there were and behind them were the red horses, horses plural, speckled and white. So interesting. I think he said, then the horses are like the horses in tribulation. Yeah, I know. So I would submit this to you. So one, I will shelf the answer in its fullness. So in short, the answer seems to be verse 10, 11, the man seems to be the answer to the Lord. I get that. I'm, I'm reserving myself that answer to be concrete because I want to do a more thorough study of the entire. Because when I read it, believe me, when I read it, I was like, I got to do a study on this. So here's, a, here's what I want to do. After we're done with the Office of Christophanes, I gotta go. I got as a guy at work. I promised I'd do a study on Proverbs five, so I gotta do that. Then we'll go back to Zechariah. Okay. And Pam said, "This is a vision. Perhaps the horse is waiting for the Lord to release him. Uh, the trees are in the garden of God in heaven." Yep. And Vicky said, "Okay." No, but I'm with you though. It's a great Zechariah is a tremendously profound book of prophetic truth. It is so. We haven't studied it before, I don't think, like ever. We've had passages here and there we've taken, but that book, in lieu of what God's already given us, we should have a real good fun time seeing what he reveals in more detail through that book. So in the spirit of world coming to an end, <laughs> so let's, let's do that one. Uh, we'll do Proverbs 5 after this study, and Zechariah will be the whole book we'll study. How about that? All right, And that should be fun. Because when we do Zechariah, Bob, now, I'm, now I'm departing. Bob. That, that, that's on you, though. Here's the choice I'm going to give you. As we think about this, think about Zechariah. When we do Zechariah, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, there's other contemporaries of Zechariah. He wasn't just on his own, which means I'll have to go into other books like Haggai and Habakkuk and other books. I'll have to go into those books as contemporaries and precursors and follow-ups to Zechariah to give you a, a, a groundswell of, of understanding, which means we'll be on this for a while. So be careful of what we're saying here. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to go back to what I said before about the book of Acts, how we finished the book of Acts, and study one of the books that Paul wrote? Because now we have a better understanding of where he was as a person. Because remember, I know you're probably going to do a prophecy, right? So, yeah, yes. And uh, Vicky said, fine by me. So I'll Vicky let you do whatever. All the horses of the apocalypse, uh, except black. Yeah, so we're going to do whatever it is that you guys think about that, chew on that for a little bit. So we'll study whatever you want to do, okay? So after this, I'm going to do Proverbs 5, but after that, then you can decide, do you want a book from Paul that we dig into, and if so, which one? And, or do you want to go through Zechariah, which we dig into that? I'm telling you right now, it's going to be months. I'll tell you that right now. Because when you get involved in that, you're talking about books. That book involves other books that involve other things. There's no way I'm getting through that in a month. There's no way. We'll be in those weeds for about three to six months. Those are good weeds to be in, by the way. And I'm, I'm, either way, I'm good with it. 
I just want to make sure you understand that if you later on go back to the books of what Paul wrote, then we're looking at losing some of the remnants, though, of understanding of the depth of the ministry he went through in the book of Acts that was studied for a year and a half. That's my only concern. But it's a, it's not even, I don't care about my concerns. I care about what you guys are led by the Spirit to tell me what you want me to talk about that's on your hearts. Then I'll just let that go. And Vicki said, what book of Paul? Whatever you do. My original thought, my original thought, was to keep it um, in the depth of the prophetic's nature and go to Colossians, myself. Ephesians and Colossians, those two. Those are the two I was going to focus in on because those are the two that deal with things that are the most oft-quoted, misunderstood, but have a lot of depth of, of, of writing to the Ephesus. He spent the most amount of time in Corinth, um, excuse me, Ephesus, excuse me, Ephesus, and then secondly, Corinth. But Ephesus, I believe, is the most important book because it is the one he spent the most amount of time. That's where he did his, remember, his Tyrannus, uh, his first seminary school was there, if you will, for three years. So he spent the most amount of time there, three years. So I would say Ephesus for that reason. It was his biggest emphasis of time spent in that place. And then with Ephesus comes Colossians because there's some parallels in how he spoke to them as well. That's why I say those two books. Yes? But in the church of Ephesus, but there's not a church of Corinth in the seventh church of Jesus. Correct, there's not. Because they were the ones that basically make up some of the Laodicean church, by the way. Because they're watered down in ignorance. Yeah. Tracy said six months, maybe 12, just like construction. Always time multiplies. Yeah, Yay, something. Ephesians. And then Vicki said, I think maybe we should continue with Paul, which would be a shorter study. And after that, to Zechariah. Okay. That's interesting. I'm surprised. <laughs> okay. So, all right. I'll do whatever you got. So we'll shut that. So now we go back. So now we, we've seen so far again that. So basically, God appears six times for a fact. May or may not have appeared to Zechariah. I think more of Zechariah's appearances, if at all, were more of a vision of in the future what he saw, not so much a physical manifestation in the present. So which means we have a concrete reference to six times that the Lord appears as the angel of Chafe. And remember, what is the number? Six is the number for man, uh, but not just man, but man's inheritance. And so that's why Satan takes the mark of the beast, 666, six, six, to say, I'm taking the inheritance from us, and he's ruling the earth. That's what he wants. He wants airship. That's why he despises those who are in line for airship. That's why he has no concern, by the way, over these uh, lower-ranking people in, in Christ that act like, I buy Satan. <laughs> really? I put on the armor of God. He laughs and goes, I don't even care about you, man. You're in no position to inherit. I already got you where I want you. Ignorant. Who I want are the people that are walking in faith, that are doing the works of faith, that are in the spirit of Christ that are in that position to inherit earth, but more so than ever, those who want to go and inherit heaven by first entering. His main priority is on those who want to enter heaven. Second priority, those who are in line to inherit earth. That's where his focus is. Everybody else is irrelevant to him. He already has you where he wants you. Ignorant and, and in bliss and disobedient. Whatever. He doesn't, he doesn't need to worry about you. He's got you where he wants you. So if you're walking by faith, but you walk by faith in a sense of closed-mindedness that nothing else matters to you, then you won't be in the air. And he doesn't care about you. He can't change the fact that you're on Christ. That he can't change. That's, that's already happened. But what he wants to do is in time, he doesn't know God's ordained will. He just knows that God will, in fact, disinherit some people. And he'll be darned if he's not going to be a part of that. He wants to be a part of that. He wants to be a part of being taken from you what was taken from him, a chance to be in heaven, to stay. That's what he wants. If he can't have it, neither can you. He took the other angels with him. Remember? He made merchandise of them in Ezekiel. He'll take you with him too. He wants to take you down, man. So he doesn't care about the other guys and gals that say, oh, I bind you, Satan. He laugh. I can see him laughing going, ha, 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 you're so ignorant. You can't bind me. What are you, ignorant? Your words, oh, I'm scared. Your words mean nothing. Your words mean nothing. Your words are useless. They mean nothing. Even Satan, even, even Michael said, let Satan, uh, let, Satan let, let, God, let the Lord God rebuke you, Satan. Michael the Archangel said, I'm not going to rebuke you. And we go, we can do it. Really? <laughs> really? We can do that. Okay. That makes no sense. Yeah, anyway, sorry, you were saying, apologize. Uh, the, the word is envy, I, I think. You know, he says, who can stand before envy? Wow. I mean, no. uh, he, he's envious. He is envious. Good. Yeah, he's, he's like the embodiment. He's like the most envious person. And second to him, like unto him, is Israel, envious of us, who are going, how can these stone tree, bug, nature worship, and polytheistic people now become monotheistic and take our God from us. 
and say that their that God is now in Yeshua, they're, 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 it's irritating to no end on three fronts. You're you're taking our faith and making it your own, and and then secondly, you're building on it a on a person that we rejected and killed, and then thirdly. Isn't your background all about being ignoramuses and worshiping stones and sticks and stupid beetles and stuff? And now you're going to be the ones ahead of us. Really? That just, it makes them so like, oh, incensed. But that's our history of Gentiles. We're all, dude, we're all dumb. We're all just dumb, you know? And, they're, and God's going, they're going, why them, God? Why not somebody of our own tribe or something? Take a tribe and do that, maybe. Exalt a tribe above us. We've kind of seen that before with the Levites, and we've seen that before with the Judahites. We've seen that. Why do you go outside the tribe to do that? that? That makes them envious, like you said, because they're like, they don't get it. And Satan's, hate, Satan's doing the same. Satan's going, hey, take from the Angelicos to, to replace me. Really? You're going to take those guys, the ones who are flesh and blood and bone, you're going to have them replace me? Oh, now I'm really ticked off. Because he's bad enough he's being replaced. But to be replaced by us, us, as being the ones who God's going to show his most endearing love to, it makes them a very envious position. So it's really interesting, the two peoples, Satan as the, the, the pinnacle, and then Israel as the secondary element of the two envious things that God has made them envious because of both reasons why. He stripped from both of them their positions in the kingdom. Both of them. Interesting. And then picture him saw when he did it, he ripped his garment. And remember that? He said, as it's ripped from you, Samuel said, so shall God rip the kingdom from you. And Saul's like, well, can you imagine him hearing those words? I've been, oh, Satan was incensed when he heard that. When he's like, get out, you know, get out. Oof. So anyway. Well, he had just drank this nice perfect and delicious like glory to go, or are we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true, right? So now, so as we saw him appear six times in, in the Old Testament, I want to entertain the idea of what is the mentioning in the New Testament when it comes to the angel of the Lord? Yeah, are these mentionings before the birth of Jesus as he appeared to jo Joseph? Is that? Christ? Is it? And the book of Acts, is that the spirit of Christ also? And many would say, oh, come on. Before the birth of Jesus, maybe, but I doubt it because it only happened before the times of Jesus. Now we're in the time of Jesus. It wouldn't, wouldn't need to be that anymore. In the book of Acts, they would say, ah, come on. Jesus already lived, died, rose again from the dead. What would that be the purpose of that? To which I would say, well, wait a minute. Lest we forget, my, my proof text would be Acts 9. Did not Jesus and the Spirit of God the Spirit of Christ, did he not appear to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus? Did he not say, he said, who are you? I am Jesus, I am Yahshua, whom you persecute. Excuse me? Well, no, you can't be, according to churchianity. They said you can't do that. Well, he did. Or what about the fact that he taught Paul for three years in the backside of the desert? Remember that? So he appeared to him, and he continued to tutor him for three years. That's a lot of time appearing to him for someone who says in, in their theology, the Christ and the Spirit can't appear like he did in the Old Testament. There's no more need for it. Well, then he, he did it to Paul. So my proof text would be open your mind to the possibility of what you don't even think may be real. So with that in mind, let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 20. Now we're in the New Testament, which is ironically interesting. When you speak of a theophany or Christophany, you're not going to find any. You're not going to find any, and I mean any, commentary that says that those appear in the New Testament. The very definition of a Christophany or a Theophany is a precursor to Christ. Once you get involved in the New Testament, which is about Christ, they cease referring to anything as a Christophany or Theophany, which is interesting. I say, forget what tradition of man says. I'm just saying, let's, let's see what say it the Lord says. Okay? So let's look and entertain our, let's have this conversation together. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But while he was reflecting on these things, Joseph, about to divorce his wife, Mary, Miriam, Yosef, while he was reflecting on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord, that's curios here, but of course it would be Chave in the actual Old Testament, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, fear not that, to take Mary, thy fiancé wife, for that being formed in her is by the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, now shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 24, and, the, and Joseph being raised from the sleep, that as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took his wife. So twice we see the angel of the Lord mentioned, but we see in verse 20 that the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Question, what was that? Was that the Spirit of Christ appearing to Joseph? 
as if to say, oh, by the way, what you see now before you is in the womb of your fiancé wife. Wow. It makes me think that. It does. It really does. And that would be an amazing different take on what really happened here. Wow. If that's the spirit of Christ saying, oh, by the way, what you're about to see is about to be infused into a little tiny baby boy. And you have a tremendous responsibility given to you, Joseph. You raise him because it's me you're raising. Inside that body is this spirit. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I won't divorce her. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> you know. Well, look in verse, chapter 2, verse 13. But they, having retired to their own country, behold, an angel of the Lord, chapter 2, verse 13 of Matthew, retired to their own country. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Again, he appeared again, saying, Arise, take that child and his mother, and fly to Egypt, and remain there until I speak to you. For Herod is about to seek the child to destroy him. So interesting. Now the child's already born, and yet there's still this appearance of the Spirit of the Lord, potentially, because it's mentioning the angel of the Lord. Is it really just an angel? Or is it the Spirit of Christ? Even though he's already infused inside that child, is he appearing saying, it is I who's in that, that form of that fetus. Go to Egypt. Is it? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? Say, but it doesn't say the angel of the Lord. Angel not in caps either. Tracy said, so it's Jesus telling Joseph about himself now. Wow. Here's what, here's what I want you to see, though. To your point, when you say that, I know what you're saying. I thought the same thing, Pam. But notice something. Go back to chapter 1 of Matthew and verse 20. See where it says, Behold! You see that? Look at the... Whoop. Put this over here. Look at that word, behold. Look how it ends with an O-U. And go back to, go back to chapter, I mean chapter, to go to page 10 of your book in the diglot. And when something ends in O-U, it's of the. That's what it means. So what it means is, behold, of the angel of the Lord. There's your the that you're missing. Because you don't see it in English. But you do in Greek. Oh, I saw that, I went, boom. I gulped and thought, okay, this very well may be the Spirit of Christ himself. It's more compelling now when you see the Greek language. The word behold is ending with the O-U, which is the phrasing under page 10 of the of the. So behold, the angel of the Lord. Todd said it says L-O. And lo, right, and lo. But it's translated, behold, I know, and lo, correct, and lo, or behold. But look at the word and how it's written, I-D-O-U, the word itself, the Greek word itself, not the English word, the Greek word itself. Then go back to page 10, and you'll see the O-U referencing under the singular genitive neutral. It's of the. Then you see that. So he says, lo. Or behold, of the angel of the Lord. That's what the translation would be. Because the of the, or the lo, or behold, word is ado, is before that word for angelos. Which it would mean that behold of the angel, of the messenger, of the angelos, so of the angel of the Lord. So there's your the that you're looking for. You say, where's the the? Where's the article to emphasize? It's veiled in Greek, but it's there. It's not in English, but it is there in the Greek. It's there. So interesting to me. But now that we see that, does that definitively make it clear that it's the Spirit of Christ talking to Joseph, to Yosef, before he's born? But then the question would come in chapter 2, after he's born, and he says, take the child and go to Egypt. That makes it even more eerie. Is he actually saying, the spirit that dwells within that child, it is I who was talking to you right now. I'm in that child right there. Let's, let's take us out of here. <laughs> is that what's happening? It's the same phrasing there, too, by the way. Behold. It's interesting, is it not? You see that? I hope you, th you see it. And Todd said, now the teaching from last week emphasizing the is lost on me. No, okay. Nope. The teaching is still emphasizing the word the, but remember, we're emphasizing it in the actual language it was written in. 
So in the English, you're not seeing the word the, but in the Greek, you do when you see the word behold. It should be translated behold the. Behold of the angel of the Lord. That's what it should be translated to say. It should say behold of the, because the suffix on the word dictates that of the should be infused into the English translation. Because it's not, you're being lost, but you shouldn't get lost when you stay with the original manuscript, you'll realize it should say, translated correctly, should say, Behold of the angel of the Lord. That's what it should say. So there's nothing to be lost on when you stay with the text of the, of the language. That's the key, though, that God hides it and veils it from the English translations, to your point. If you're staying with English, you get lost. When you dig into the Greek manuscript, into Koine Greek, and you go, oh, in the language, behold is written in the suffix of o u u, so it's adu, so therefore it means lo of the or behold of the. Oh my gosh, how come the English guy didn't translate it that way? Because they didn't. But they should have. That's what you have page 10 for, to go back to and reference, to know what it should be. All right? So I hope that makes sense, helps you. So it's not off the beaten path from the original Greek manuscript, but it is aloof from the English, but not from the original Koine Greek. Does that help to answer the question or the comment, I hope? I'm hoping so. Because it is there, just not in English. It's there in the original language. Chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 19. Again, he says, Behold, all three times that he appears to him, in chapter 1, verse 